I used to teach a course at RISD on a regular basis, and it was quite popular. Uh, and it was called Automobility. And so this is, in a way, a highly compressed version of what I used to do in an entire semester. Um, so it starts something like this. Um, when humans started to settle in one place, uh, something we call urbanization, their uh, human population stabilized at around somewhere between 10 and 100 million people. And for a long, long, long time, since the, the starting of settlements of agriculture, the agricultural revolution started around 10,000 BC. And uh, that was really, once you have agriculture, you have permanent settlements. And that's the process we call urbanization. And that's really what is the star of the show here is urbanization uh, and the impact of the automobile on that process very recently. So for most of human history, the, the human population was somewhere between 10 million and 100 million. Then something happened, and we shot up to a billion in the blink of an eye. Uh, it started around 1000 BC. And we hit the one billion mark about the time of the, industri the first Industrial Revolution, around the time of American independence, just to place it in perspective. And about the same time, a man, an amateur mathematician by the name of Thomas Malthus, made the observation uh, that our food supply is increasing very quickly to support this larger population. But as fast as it's growing, it is growing in an arithmetic in arithmetic progression, whereas population tends to grow exponentially. And as any uh, mathematician will tell you, or anyone who's taken math, that at some point, the arithmetic increase will inevitably be overcome by the exponential increase. And so he was the first one to sound the alarm bells that, hey, um, we're going to be in trouble. And uh, him being a, a white male in England, a wealthy white male in England, uh, and at that time, the fashionable thing to do is to say, we need to stop the population growth of non-white uh, poor people. Poor people and non-white people. And so uh, that was the big cry. And of course, uh, thankfully, we didn't do that in most places. And population start, continued to grow. But uh, it really had very little to do uh, with human action um, or inaction. It was a natural progression. So in order to watch what happens next, what we're going to do is we're going to compress the, the horizontal axis so that we're not looking this so much. And we're going to stretch this way out. So we're going to distort the same data. And it's going to look like this. And so if it took 3,000 years, three or 4,000 years to pop up from around 10, or 10 to 100 million up to 1 billion, uh, the next billion only took 130 years. So think about that. It accelerated dramatically. Medical uh, innovations extended longevity, but still people were still having lots of children. Uh, around this time, Buckminster Fuller started to theorize about systems and systems theory, about inputs and outputs. And I just throw in this image of his car uh, that also turns into an airplane, um, theoretically. Um, and But things continue pretty much as they had always continued except it got faster. And now you'll notice it took only 35 years to hit 3 billion. Now is when the Club of Rome uh, issued a report, uh, and uh, Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb, warning of the dangers of growing population. And we saw the first photographs uh, from the moon of the Earth, and we started to realize that Buckminster Fuller has something, uh, might be onto something here, the whole Earth catalog celebrated the fact that the Earth was a, a finite system. And the aesthetic and, and 
the thought patterns of environmentalism, which had always been there, by the way. It's nothing new. But it started to become uh, more and more important. And so you can probably guess what happens next. Uh, it takes only 15 years to hit 4 billion, 13 years to hit 5 billion. Uh, about this time, Jared Diamond writes the book Collapse, uh, documenting the history of human civilizations one by one, despite their tremendous successes uh, and the predictability of their self-destruction if they continue along those paths, uh, there's no, there appears to be nothing that can stop a society from destroying itself when it sets its mind to it. Um, and so we continue on uh, 12 years. And I apologize for any of you who are uh, prone to depression or things like this. But th there's a happy, it's not the end of the story, but there's a happy end to this chapter, um, believe it or not. It might be tempting to think that this goes on forever until we drown in our own waste uh, or the planet simply implodes from the burden of humans. Um, but that is not necessarily what happens. The United Nations and their team of brilliant demographers working globally have determined with pretty, pretty high certainty that the acceleration slows down, and this is what magically happens sometimes in the next century, in this century. And for the purpose of argument, I like to call this the 10 billion person world. Now, if you shrink, if you, if you put back the scale to what it was, it looks like this. And you say, wow. And not only that, but if the UN is right, let's presume they are, it goes like this for basically forever. And then in the blink of an eye, there's a demographic wall that we hit. And we shoot from 10 million to 10 billion in the blink of an eye. Pretty much in your professor's lifetime. Um, and then it's 10 billion. And for as far as we can tell, this continues out as far as this continued out. So it's really an interesting moment to be looking at these issues. And there are reasons for this that's in the recording. You can study that. There are variations in the, in the probability. It could continue like this, or it could drop dramatically. Uh, but the interesting thing that is the next part of this story is that the developed world around World War II was a little bit less than a billion people. Remember World War II, we were about 2 billion population globally. The developed world is about a little less than a billion. The less developed worlds, or the, what we called at that point the third world, uh, was a little bit more than a billion. And so, okay, we got these two worlds and we're, we're doing fine. But the less developed countries shoot up. Now we're, we're making a distinction between rural populations and urban populations. And so in the developed world, the, world, the rural population has been dropping since 1950. We have been uh, urbanizing dramatically as a proportion of our population. But our population is relatively small compared to this huge increase in the less developed countries or in the developing countries. And their urban population shows no end in sight. Pretty soon, globally, in the developing countries, or what we now call the emerging economies, their rural population will also peak in, at the end of this decade and start to drop. Their urban population will grow. So that's basically that story. Now here's the thing. If our population is stabilizing at 10 billion, everything's cool, right? We, we dodged the bullet. We can manage 10 billion, right? We're managing 7 billion right now. We can have, manage uh, another 3 billion people. No problem, right? No, it's a problem. So what is the problem? It's about consumption. It's not about how many people there are. It's about 
the number of people times the amount each person consumes and the impact that consumption has on the planet. So, sorry, but the next chapter is a little bit scarier than the population bomb one because there's a consumption bomb. If you compress that wall of population explosion down to this red line and you plot the, the, the impact as measured by its surrogate, which is, of course, per capita spending globally. How much does the average human spend, which is proportional at the moment, it's proportional to the impact they have on the environment and the reduction of resources. Um, that is projected to rise. And that's what this lecture is about. This is placing the, that in context. Why is everyone in the world destined to become basically an American consumer? And there are two things going on. Well, there are two big things about automobility uh, that were covered in the reading that we want to focus on in this lecture. Here's a cartogram that shows um, the current impact by country if the impact is higher than average, the country gets fatter. And if the impact is lower than average, the country gets smaller. Um, and there's no data for India. But um, India and China, India, China, and Indonesia are number one, two, and four in terms of population. And so they're the ones to watch. And you could watch Brazil as well. Um, the United States is the third largest population in the world. Uh, it consumes, it's only 4% of the global population, but consumes 25% of its resources. Uh, so when you hear statements on the news that, well, you know, we're just one country, we can't really do anything alone, well, that's actually uh, a lie. Uh, the world is waiting for us to take the lead. Um, so the key to how this plays out, we will either uh, overwhelm the planet or we won't overwhelm the planet depending on the way we urbanize. Urbanization turns out to be the, the game-changing factor. Uh, here's a portrayal of the cities of the world uh, currently in the degree of urbanization. Um, uh, 25 years from now and 50 years from now. And so you can see where is that urbanization taking place. Here's another view of the world. This is a very finely detailed, very high resolution. So you can zoom in on any of these places. And what you notice is cute little old United States and Western Europe, not really a factor. This is where the game is. Uh, northern India, northern and southern India, um, these areas of China, Korea, Tokyo, and the island of Java. Those are really the, the, the game-changing places where this happens. And so this is a, um, there are various representations of, of these trends. This one highlights the role that Turkey is going to play in the urbanization. Now the energy, the consumption, the energy use per capita, and this is where the car comes in. What are the big things that will make a difference? The Union of Concerned Scientists in the 1990s came out with a report and they said the big sectors where this happens are the energy usage of buildings, and you know that because you're exposed to uh, Ed Mas Masria's uh, analysis, which is inaccurate but um, not, not a bad guide. A call to action for architects to reduce the impact of buildings. That is definitely a big one, especially in terms of heating and cooling. Uh, the next one is food. And the big thing there is meat. The planet can either uh, manage to supply uh, a population of 30 billion humans if we eat like Indians do, vegetarian basically, or if the whole world population eats the way Americans do, it can support about 2 billion. So we'd have to go back in time to the, you know, to the 1920s or 30s 
the 40s to get to that population level. So the planet cannot sustain a planet of meat eaters. Uh, it can't sustain a planet of leaky, large footprint buildings. But it turns out the biggest single factor is transportation. And the biggest single component of transportation is private automobile use. And the fastest growing impact in the world is private automobile use. So whenever you see graphs of uh, CO2 emissions, and actually uh, because of fracking um, and other things, uh, there has been actually a reduction of some of the impacts in the United States. But don't get too complacent. It's really about the increase in miles driven, not in the United States. We've actually turned it around. The miles driven per capita has re reduced since 2007. Um, miraculously and completely against all predictions. Uh, so it really is not about the United States in and of itself, but the role the United States plays as a leader and as an influencer. We are still the number one influencer of the world, if that's a, if that's a word, uh, because of our cultural power. We have tremendous cultural capital. If we did it in the 50s, India and China wants to do it now. Uh, and so if we do it now, maybe India, China, Indonesia, and Brazil will want, and, and Nigeria will want to do it uh, at some point in the future. But our moment on the stage as the kings of cultural capital is not forever. It is contingent, and it is limited, and we have a few moments left on stage to, uh, to uh, exhibit some leadership. Uh, but that moment is fading quickly. So the biggest single contributor to carbon dioxide uh, is personal vehicle travel. And it is the fastest growing contributor to carbon dioxide and global greenhouse gases. And so if we look at the vehicle ownership rate of the United States, we started out very modestly. And it shot up uh, between the wars. And uh, by the 1920s, uh, we had uh, we were about 200 automobiles per 1,000 population, which is where Bangladesh was. Um, this is an outdated graphic. It's from 1995, but it's still the clearest one. So I, I have lots of boring ones that are more up to date, but this is the clearest one. Um, uh, basically, what it shows in the last 20 years. Um, is a drop in the United States car ownership and vehicle miles driven in the last few years. And so uh, during the Great Depression, things slowed down. Uh, automobiles were no longer produced. Uh, instead, we re retooled for uh, constructing tanks and airplanes, which is the reason we won the wo World War II. And then after World War II, it just shot up like a rocket for various reasons. And we'll get into a list of those reasons. Um, it's interesting to look at Los Angeles. Now, I've, I've covered the first thing that is interesting about automobility, is that it is the single biggest contributor to, uh, to environmental destruction and planetary death. Uh, the second thing that makes it very interesting, uh, in two weeks, I'll be giving a talk that makes the point that um, the built environment is not simply a reflection of our culture and our values. It is also an instrument by which our culture and values are reproduced ex and extended. Now, you've all taken the history of architecture, so you're quite familiar with stories like, uh, well, the story of architecture throughout history is often, most often told as one of reflection, of passive reflection that the values at the time of the Roman Empire, the values at the time of ancient Greece, the values at the time of the Renaissance, et cetera, fill in the blank, are these. And because the values were this way, cause, the architecture manifested those values in this way, effect. So there was a cause and effect relationship between culture and values and meanings and architecture. What is not emphasized so much in the usual teaching of architectural history 
is the role played by the architecture in the other direction. Architecture often plays a significant role in promoting the values and cultural meanings of a society. And all you have to do is look at Sharp Cathedral. That was not simply a reflection of Christian values. It was an instrument by which the peasants that walked dozens of miles to Chart and entered a stone building. Who had ever seen a stone building? Much less a building that was uh, 60 times taller than anything in my village. Much less a building that seemed to defy gravity and lean over and touch itself. Much less a building with stained glass. And so the light entering Chart Cathedral for a person at that time was like entering heaven. And that's exactly what it was intended to do. Just like the internet and advertising and television and all of this is an instrument for selling things and promoting certain values and beliefs, Chart Cathedral was the internet, was the film industry, was all of that in the building. And Victor Hugo has written about this uh, in terms of Notre Dame. Uh, and the relationship between the cathedral and writing. Uh, he wrote a chapter that said, this will kill that, that the written word and publishing and the printing press will kill the cathedral because it will displace it uh, from the central place of the conveyor of meaning. Well, that was a little exaggerated. Architecture still is an extremely powerful instrument of convincing people of certain things. But Chart Cathedral was an instrument for giving people who might have doubts an experience of what it's like to enter the gates of heaven. And it worked uh, tremendously well. So the idea that, that uh, architecture is not just a passive reflection of our values, but also an instrument of promoting our values is a tough thing for some people to grasp. Uh, we can talk about Shark Cathedral. In two weeks, I'll be giving a talk uh, at lunchtime about the research of Pierre Bourdieu, who uh, talked about how Islam in a remote village in the desert of northern Africa uh, restructured the space of the village because it was important for men not to encounter women. So there were two paths. There was the path for women, there was the path for men. And there was the lower story of each house for men and the upper story of each house for women. And so there was a restructuring of space. And it wasn't just a reflection of Muslim values. It was an instrument for maintaining the social order according to the laws of Islam. And so, but these examples are so remote from us. So can, are there any examples closer to home of this this phenomenon where the built environment is not just a reflection of our tastes and our desires and our aspirations for mobility, but is actually uh, an instrument that operates and restructures the way we think. It gets into our heads and changes the structure of our brains. And um, the reading um, that uh, for today was actually a remarkable uh, piece of writing and research by John Uri, who is a genius, um, although he might, arguably, he goes too far in this piece. We're not ready for everything he says, I think. Um, but he really just, in a matter-of-fact way, points out the car and the automobile industry and the infrastructure that supports the automobile has transformed not just the physical space of our world, it has transformed the way we think. It transforms what it means to be a citizen of, with full rights to our society. And um, one of the great illustrations of this is Los Angeles. Um, so I'm just going to go in for a moment. And some of you who have seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit, how many people have seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit? So you may know the story if you've seen Chinatown. Um, it leaks out. This, parts of the story. Basically, Los Angeles was a desert wasteland and there were no palm trees. That is a cultural construction. The 
palm trees were brought in, photographs were taken, real estate was sold, and LA uh, was built. Um, oil was discovered in LA, and I have I I took out about a hundred images, and one of them was all the oil rigs. One every 50 feet was another oil rig uh, out to the horizon in Venice Beach, California. But at one point, everyone knows now that nobody walks in LA, right? There's even a song called, what's it called? Nobody Walks in LA, that's right. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> but believe it or not, at one point, Los Angeles uh -huh. had the most complete public transportation network system in the world. So what's the story here? Why did it get built and why is it gone? And why are they now trying to uh, rebuild a tiny, tiny fraction of what was there before uh, for $100 million per linear mile? Um, well, here's the story. In Chinatown, we get the subplot that they built canals and aqueducts and brought water to the LA basin. And it became extremely productive farmland, and the palm trees came in, and the image of L.A. was promoted all over the world, and people moved there. It was uh, basically a real estate developer's dream, and uh, it had a great port, and so industry located there. The car industry was very big in L.A., and so it boomed, um, and it boomed in a way that was made possible by streetcars. Land is either worthless or valuable, depending on two things. If you look at LA, is there water? Check, we got the aqueducts. Is there a way to get to the land? Well, that was a problem. So what did the real estate developers do? They invested a little bit of their money in streetcars. And wherever their streetcar went, the land became valuable. That sounds weird to us, right? Because the MBTA, what is the MBTA? They, they don't care about land value. Well, actually, this is the normal condition. Throughout history and everywhere else in the world, except for the United States, transportation is all about the value of land. Most places, they don't have to charge much in the fare box. They can never make enough money in the fare box. That's the dirty truth of transit systems. It is not possible, except for in Hong Kong, to make enough money from charging fares to pay for the system. It just doesn't work out. You'd have to pay $8 a ride, and no one's going to ride it at $8 a ride. So it doesn't make sense, except when it's connected to land value. When you make a piece of land accessible by streetcar in the 1920s, it goes from being worth basically something like a dollar an acre to $100 an acre. If you take a tiny fraction of that increased value of $99 an acre and funnel it towards the streetcar, you've got a beautiful symbiotic system of land value and access. The problem is that uh, at some point after World War II, we decided that we wanted to decouple land value from transit systems. And so our transit systems have been bankrupted ever since. And so that's a problem. And the MBTA, we're trying a little experiment now with the MBTA. Let's let the system go bankrupt and let it shrivel down to nothing. Let's see if that's OK. Um, and so at the end of that experiment, I suspect we will be ready to rejoin land value and transit, and, and we'll be back with the rest of the world. But until then, sorry about the transit service. It could be a lot better. So, um, so LA, based on this economic coupling of land value and transit like the rest of the world, developed a highly sophisticated streetcar system. This is 
downtown area. This is the general pattern of a streetcar suburb, and you'll recognize this uh, because Boston is one of the places where the streetcars from the 1920s still exist. And it's, and it's not as it's not as uh, it's not as big as it was in the 1920s, but there's still remnants in the Green Line. But basically, the idea is that you have a hierarchy of streets. You have uh, shopping streets with streetcars, and then you have residential blocks without streetcars. And so the density goes down here, it goes up here, and it follows a general rhythm that is established by the easily accessible walking distance to a shopping street and to mass transit. It's a completely sensible thing that uh, the rest of the world has enjoyed since the dawn of the era of the streetcar about 100 years ago, and never had it disrupted. And we are frantically, desperately, and pathetically trying to rebuild it after destroying it. So why did we destroy it? And here's the larger network of Los Angeles and representation of the intercity rail system uh, that looks a lot like uh, what the Randstad in the Netherlands has. Um, you can go from any city to any other city uh, on rail, rent a bike at the train station, and go wherever you're going, come back, get back to the bike, go back to your home train station, pick up your bike, and it's, it's an amazing network. Los Angeles and the Randstad are basically the same air, uh, surface area, similar population, similar size of the economy, completely different urban fabric pattern. So it's a very interesting thing to compare. So when the car first started, it was a luxury. Doctors were the ones who needed cars. Uh, but everyone else, uh, it was for pleasure trips. Um, one of the most important designers, important in terms of impact, of the 20th century was um, Adolf Hitler, because he invented the largest piece of architecture, arguably, ever, which is the freeway. And here he is uh, in the groundbreaking of one of the first freeways in Germany, which just, uh, became a very widespread network after World War II. Before and after World War II, his um, example was copied in places like New York City. Uh, the urban freeway network, um, especially under the leadership of Robert Moses, uh, transformed the metropolitan area and the entire state and eventually the entire continent. Um, it started out as something like this, a lot of ample space, safe roads. Uh, space means safety. Um, and uh, culturally, it was a tremendous uh, positive thing in terms of uh, culturally uh, the national sense of who we are as a nation. Uh, the thing to do is to experience the nation by car. Go to Yosemite, and this is a, an exhibition promoting the, the magical experience of visiting the great sites of North America by car. It also was tremendously successful after World War II. Uh, what do you do with all this excess industrial production that produced uh, tanks and planes? Uh, you've got to keep those factories going. You've got to keep the jobs going. And so uh, you, you retool, and now you build the, free, the interstate freeway system and the, the suburbs. Now, a lot of this is about what are the special conditions of, I'm going to go back one. What are the special conditions that made the United States so different than the rest of the world? Well, we talked about one of them, which was the, um, the we, we started out with streetcars, but then we disconnected streetcars and transportation from land values. Another thing happened, uh, and this is a story um, that is told in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, that um, a, a consortium of automobile-related companies uh, tire companies, car manufacturers, they met in secret and they decided, they, they hatched a plan. They identified a small bus company in a Midwestern town, I can't remember which one, and basically they invested in this small bus company and it became National Bus Lines. And then city after city, is that name right, Gene? Um, and then city after city, they went in and they purchased these uh, streetcar lines that had been operating independently 
And then in many cities, they consolidated into a single municipal agency that managed the streetcar lines, and it became disconnected from land values. And so it wasn't doing so well. So when National Bus Lines came along and said, hey, we will buy the streetcar system from you, Chicago, from you, Cincinnati, from you, Indianapolis, from you, Los Angeles, from you, basically every significant city in the United States. The city said, sure, you'll give us cash for this thing that's pulling us down? Sure, here you go, take it. So the first thing they did was they didn't just stop running streetcars and replace them with buses, which is, they did do that. They also spent an additional significant amount of money to pull the rails out of the ground. You know how expensive that is? Why would you do that? It's really expensive. They invested a significant amount of money to pull the rails out of the streets. And they didn't just mothball and store the streetcars. They burned them. And it was not for a few decades. I'm probably getting some of these details wrong. But it took a while. But eventually, the secret was found out. And they were sued. And in the court of law, the judge found National Bus Lines guilty. And their subsidiary, the, the funders of the National Bus Lines, were found guilty of conspiracy against the public interest. And um, it would have been a devastating uh, victory for the rights of consumers in the United States. But uh, it happened fairly silently. And they were fined $1 each. So the billions of dollars being invested uh, in Oregon, in LA, to reconstruct what had been in place, uh, the, at least they got $4 to offset those billions. Uh, it was, um, it's a remarkable chapter in the history of this stuff. But it gives you a hint as to what makes the United States different from other places. Um, so there are whole books. And you'd have to read three or four books, but um, uh, Ken Jackson's Crabgrass Frontier, I think, does the best job listing all the weird things the United States did that distorted the natural market forces that would have uh, favored the much more efficient mass transportation system over the highly inefficient, very expensive, extremely uh, unlikely uh, system of automobility that we have. Um, but the list goes something like this. Um, the Federal Housing Authority established mortgage laws that made it very, uh, after World War II, made it very inexpensive to buy your own house. If you were renting in the city for $40 a month, you could now own your own house in the new suburbs that were being built after World War II for a mere $30 a month. Great deal. If you're white, you can do that. Uh, another factor was the interstate highway system. All of a sudden, it made living in the city horrible because the highway went right through the middle of the city. And it made living in the country a lot more attractive. Uh, it also made the commute from the country, from the suburbs, into the city faster than the commute in the city because the bus, you know, how long am I going to wait for the bus? Forget it. If I'm white, I move out. Um, and then the, the next thing that happened is the schools were abandoned in the cities. It's not a direct connection to uh, the automobile and suburbia, but is arguably the most power and continues to be the most powerful force if you love living in the city and you're committed to living in the city, have children and now see what you think. Can you afford private school? Are you OK having your child go to the public schools in Boston? It's a completely different game-changing equation. And it changes people's minds like that. And um, so the city has made a comeback. As long as you don't have children, the city has become an increasingly attractive option. People who had moved out of the cities of the Northeast and moved to Florida are moving back because medical care is better, 
cultural life is better. When I am no longer able to drive, I can still get around. And so as long as you don't have children, cities are great places. Um, but the schools are a huge factor. And the list goes on and on and on, including the federal subsidies for housing in multiple forms, including the gas taxes, the road investment. Uh, uh, all of these things uh, have a distorting effect on what would normally be a more incremental and connected, and I'm trying to avoid the word natural because you should be suspicious of the word natural, but a much more sensible connection between economic decisions and transportation. And the other thing that happened is in the area of the professions. Architecture, you probably know, uh, architects used to participate in the design of larger built environment situations. And then we split off and architects looked at buildings. And planners looked at the design of the built environment. Uh, but something happened on the way to designing the built environment. Something, uh, the development of the art and science of transportation planning and the engineering of transportation planning, especially as uh, developed in the United States after World War II. They were called transportation planning programs, but uh, they started with step one, which was assume that in the future there is no transportation system except the personal automobile. And so it doesn't matter what step two, three, and four are. Step one is make that assumption because uh, there was clearly a consensus after World War II that Nothing else made sense. And somewhere in the, first, in the list of the top 10 steps in transportation planning came the rule, if you have traffic congestion, widen the roads and increase the speeds. And also included in the top 10 rules, if you have problems with parking, increase the zoning requirements for parking. Parking is not determined by market forces. Zoning determines parking. If you ask a developer, um, what if you weren't required to, to provide parking? Would you provide parking? The developer's answer in an instant would be, hell no. It never pays for itself. It's, it's extremely wasteful. You can't stack it efficiently. It's horrible. Um, if you are planning, maybe some of you in your co-op have run into this. Uh, the client wants an office uh, facility for his workers. How many workers does he have? Let's say he employs 100 people. So how big of a building does he need? Well, the average worker uh, occupies, let's say, a cubicle, and then a certain portion of bathrooms, hallways, elevator stairways, uh, coffee machines, kitchenette, conference room, OK. So for each worker, multiply each worker by 350 square feet. And that's how big the office building is. OK, so 100 workers, you do the math. 35,000 square feet. Or, yeah. So far, so good. But now the question, uh, is this in downtown Boston, near downtown Crossing? Is it on Huntington Avenue, where the Green Line is? Or is it out in Wellesley? It turns out that is the bigger question. Because for every employee that arrives by the T or the bus, uh, how much space do you need for, uh, how much additional space do you need? Nothing. If they bicycle, you might want to add a shower. So another half a square foot per, I don't know. That's, that's even too much. So basically nothing. But if it's out in Wellesley, how much space do you need uh, to add per employee? Any guesses? How big is a car? Parking spot, 8 by 20, it's not going to be 60. But wait, we, when we did the person, we did corridors and bathrooms and all this stuff. So a parking space, if it's 100, let's call it 150 square feet for a parking space. How much for all these? Uh, for all these driveways, et cetera. 450 square feet. So the car 
consumes more space than the employee. Not only that, the employee space can be stacked. The car space, yeah, it can be stacked. But when you stack it, it goes up to 500, 600 square feet per car because the driveways get longer. It's extremely expensive. Structured parking is very, very expensive. If it were market forces, parking at Wentworth would not be free, which is what most drivers experience because they don't enforce those tickets. They towed someone once in 1994, I think. Um, I'm not sure this is accurate. That's accurate. Um, so it's free, or if you follow the rules, and I don't know why you would, $2 a day, or two fifty. They match it so it costs the same amount as the tea. So maybe it's 3 or $4 a day. Um, what would you have to charge to reflect the, the value of the land? You would have to charge $75 a day to park at Wentworth to reflect the value of the land of this neighborhood. Do we do that? No. If we, if we actually captured the value of the land of Wentworth, we would have a choice. Either build a new recreation center, state of the art, or stop paying tuition, stop charging tuition, or create an endowment. We would have lots of options. But um, the culture is such that we don't even think that. A few years ago, when the planning process was happening, uh, and there was a discussion of relocating Sweeney Field over where the parking is, you should have seen the rage on the faces of my fellow faculty members. Over my dead body. You reduce my parking footprint over my dead body. It was quite dramatic. Did they do that there? Oh, I don't know. But it's a common story. A free parking spot is my God-given right as an American. And we know that with every fiber of our being. And it's a very difficult thing to change. So, um, so if you take the logical outcome of these rules, just two rules. When there's a traffic jam, widen the freeway. And when there's not enough parking, increase the zoning requirement. This is downtown Houston. About 85% of the land area is for parking and cars. 15% for buildings. Houston has one of the worst traffic problems in the country. So if you follow these rules, the proper thing to do is to reduce the footprint of the buildings and increase the amount of parking and roadways. So what is the right balance between uh, the usable program area of buildings and the parking and driving circulation system that Corbusier presented to us um, as one of the four functions of the city? Well, that's an open question. But um, we seem to now be getting to understand that whenever you ride in the, the, whenever you ride in the freeway, Traffic will increase where you widened it, and congestion will get worse everywhere else. That's called induced demand. And you can look at a lot of reports and say, oh, we found out about induced demand in 2003 when that study was published. Well, the term was created in 1933, within a few months of the first freeway built in Pas between Pasadena and downtown LA. So it's no. No, it's not rocket science. It's no surprise. We've always known this was true. We have just selectively chosen to ignore it for whatever reasons. And whatever reasons have to do with cultural forces. So downtown Houston. So what's behind this? And I'm sorry this is so small. Um, it has to do with the architecture of the automobile itself. One person is the typical, 1.3 is the typical occupancy of a, of a car. And if you take 35 cars, it looks something like this. And so for each person, you know, that's the space it takes. Again, it's like 
the office space, 350 square feet per employee, 450 square feet per employee car. Now, you could put them in a bus, and it looks like that. Or you could have mixed traffic, which is kind of the inevitable long-term scenario, and it looks like that. It's a much, you, you just reduce the number of cars. You don't have to eliminate cars. That's a beautiful thing. By simply reducing the number of cars, you get a huge increase in the benefits. Similarly, architecturally, if this is the footprint of a retail shop, uh, the zoning laws were changed to require parking, but that wasn't enough. So the zoning laws were changed to require parking like this. So if you're the owner of the shop, do you really want to reduce your investment your opportunity to sell things from here to this. You have to go from selling TVs and small appliances to Rolexes in order to keep in business, given that spatial ratio. Uh, parking is a big deal. The space of the freeway is a big deal. Um, the interesting thing about what architects do is if, to the extent that the automobile is a cultural uh, thing, not purely a technical thing. It's not a question of pure market forces. We've looked at all the distortions of pure market forces. It is tremendously, powerfully a cultural uh, phenomenon that we know who the winners and losers of our society are. The winners drive great cars. Right? We know that. The losers are waiting for the bus or riding their bicycles. I can say that because that's how I get it. So winner or loser. And it's not just the car. It's the house. It's a package. And something has happened recently, though. After the transformation of the landscape, according to these dimensions, uh, the driving in the United States has actually gone down. So there's something about the car that has lost its cultural cachet. And I have no clue, because I'm old. You guys, how many people drive regularly? Well, if I had asked that question five years ago in this classroom, there would have been two hands that didn't go up. So something is happening to you that is changing things. I think it has to do with that $100 car payment is no longer nearly as attractive as the $100 phone bill. No? No, it's the $42,000. I have a car, Leo. Okay. <laughs> That's part of it, too. Um, now, the question is, what is the cultural message of our built environment internally, and what's our cultural message externally? So I'm going to go into the next chapter of this story and looking internally first at the cultural constructions. Do you know where this is? It's New York, right? No, it's open quote, New York, comma, New York, close quote. And it's located in Las Vegas. Exactly. Um, we love to refer to places. Uh, and here we are at Rodeo Drive, right? No, that's Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, it actually looks nothing like Rodeo Drive, but we're selling real estate. Rodeo Drive. America. So Paris, Las Vegas, uh, the Bellagio, Las Vegas. Uh, it, cultural messages conveyed through architecture sells. When uh, students study the history of architecture outside of the United States, you would think they would study the history of Chinese architecture, the history of Japanese architecture. 
the history of Turkish architecture. And there might be some of that. More and more, we're doing that. But basically, it's the same exact history course you take. And they learn all about the Colosseum, and they learn all about the Acropolis. And when they graduate, they work for real estate developers, and they build what they know, the Acropolis inside the Colosseum, as the marketing office of a real estate development. That's good stuff. The Duomo in, from Florence as the entry gate to a gated community in Indonesia. Trevi Fountain, nothing is off limits. It's all good. Um, and this is the way the rest of the world, this is, this is the US big cities, big urban agglomerations. This is China. So this is reinforcing the question of urbanization. The United States, that's great. That's so cute. Uh, but the real story where the rubber hits the road literally is not in the United States. It's what happens elsewhere. And right now, the cultural model that is transforming the rest of the world is the real estate development of Southern California and Las Vegas. You take something that conveys a certain image and you replicate it. This is a, a famous palace in France that is now condominiums. Design, uh, this is the developer. Does he look proud of what he's achieved? You bet he is. All the way to the bank. And it also comes into play in the World Bank financed uh, Asian interstate highway system I could show you a slide of the United States interstate highway system, and except for this blank area and the difficult topography of China, it's not so different. The ring roads of the world, the Japanese, uh, uh, Japanese International Cooperative Agency, something like that, is um, after World War II, Japan said, uh, when the United States said, oh, we'll rebuild your infrastructure, we'll give you an interstate highway system, Japan wisely said, are you crazy? Have you seen our country? It's really small, high population density. No, thank you, we'll do trains. And then the automobile industry said, hey, what about us? And so the U.S. said, okay, you can build the tanks and jeeps for our Korean War. At the end of the Korean War, this huge machinery in Japan said, Hey, what about us? And Japan said, build all the cars you want, just don't sell them to Japanese. Here's an idea. We will give foreign aid to Thailand to develop their infrastructure and let them buy the cars. Worked beautifully. And so all over the world, there are offices of the of Japanese International Cooperation Agency promoting ring road construction uh, around every city in the developing world. And it is happening rapidly. Um, and so here's a quick tour of some of the consequences. And so uh, it looks like the United States, right? It's good. And journalists go to these places. They take photographs, and they see concrete and steel and glass skyscrapers. They see gated communities, they see crowded freeways, and they say, hooray, the world is, there's a burgeoning middle class, which would be true except for the word middle. There is nothing middle about the middle class. Even in the United States, there's a question, how middle is the middle class? The middle class is shrinking, tiny fraction is getting extremely wealthy, most people are moving into what we used to call the, what did we call it, the working class barely making it by every month because of the student loans, the car payments, the phone, um, and if you're lucky, the house payments. But the rest of the world, who are these people driving? Is that the middle class? I think it's more precise to call them the consumer class because typically they are the 5% of the population that can afford to consume things in malls. They can afford to buy cars. They can afford to buy real estate, formally developed housing, rather than live in shanties, um, where a vast majority of the population lives and will live as the world hits 10 billion. 
And so um, the automobile companies of the world, in the most recent version of dismantling the streetcars, they are promoting social justice for the poor and downtrodden of the world. Those poor people in India and China and Indonesia deserve the same degree of personal mobility and freedom that we Americans enjoy. And so we are going to make sure that they can have those freedoms. They will be liberated from the oppression of mass transit. They will own cars. So we're going to expand that 5% to 15%. What happens when you triple the number of people driving? This goes on. It doesn't get better. And this is just the use of space in cities. Remember how we began? Remember where CO2 comes from disproportionately? What happens to the planet when you increase the level of driving from 5% to 15% to 50% to 70%? Um, things go bad very quickly. In the meantime, we're up in the ante. Some people know what this is. What is it? Right, it's a, it's a housing development. I'm not sure, is it in Florida? Anywhere. It's a subdivision. But instead of roads and driveways, there are roads and driveways. You better believe it. But there are also runways and taxiways because the residents here have their own planes. This is John Travolta's house. <laughs> so we're up in the ante in some ways, um, and the rest of the world, Dubai, was a desert and exploded, uh, according to these models of development, indoor skiing in the desert, bigger, taller, better, faster. Um, So these, let me, so the, um, so the, the cultural impact of, of automobiles, as described in the reading, cannot be understated. We, if you grow up, and we did all grow up, knowing who the winners and losers are according to who drives to high school and who walks and who takes the bus, God forbid. Uh, that, you know, we all live in a high school social situation. We know who the winners are, we know who the losers are, and we know it partially by their houses and by what they drive. Here's Diller and Scofidio. Um, architects have a role to play. Frank Gehry and his BMW. Uh, the built environment, slow down, there's people here, 50 miles an hour. Um, we talked about the distorting factors of uh, government laws. Uh, and here's the graph that shows the completely unexpected decrease in vehicle miles driven. We, we expected it to maybe slow down during the recession periods, which are shown in gray. But we didn't expect this. Apparently, people are driving less. We expected this. But we expected this to continue, because no, at no time in human history had this gone down. But we're getting this. And this is adjusted, this is comparing gas prices do not necessarily have a direct correspondence to it. It's happening um, anyway. There are various ways to do that. And walking has become the new driver of real estate value. Real estate values are now very closely coupled with how walkable the neighborhood is. And real estate brokers are now using walkability indexes to identify the most favorable neighborhoods to move to because people apparently appreciate 
what it means to walk. And uh, this is a famous diagram that, um, I don't know if you've seen it or you'll see it. Um, but these are the, the uh, David, Donald Appleyard drew this uh, quite a while ago, uh, making the point about livable streets. When you live on a busy street, um, what are your social connections? And so it's a, it's a, it's a plan, combination of plan and elevation, uh, and you're tracing the paths of the human body uh, to take the measure of human interactions. Uh, and uh, also incorporating into it the comments of the people who live there. So this is a powerful deployment of our tools of drawing in order to understand and take the measure of something. Now you compare this to a very similar street with light traffic. So the difference it makes, the automobile impact uh, on a streetscape uh, that you may have heard called an outdoor room, this is architecture. This is one wall of the room. This is another wall of the room. This is a social space that happens to have cars driving through the middle. Children can either play here safely without adult supervision or not, depending on the degree and frequency, the attitudes of the people driving through. If you compare this highly sociable street with the, the one with heavier traffic, it gives a dramatic illustration of the quality of life available to people who live in neighborhoods with lower traffic. We spend so much effort on zoning controls to keep our factories away from our houses, and then those factories got smaller and got wheels. And those factories are now circulating within our houses, and we're ignoring that um, to our uh, great suffering. Uh, in terms of the livability and quality of life. You do not want to be them. Now the culture is changing. It's being led by things like uh, the Dutch. Uh, this is now fashionable. I just saw a Craigslist ad where a guy was saying, um, do you want to buy my Dutch bike? It's a chick magnet. Um, and it was a hilarious ad uh, saying how cool it is in some neighborhoods in Brooklyn to have this kind of a bike. Um, and so this is increasingly the new model. And I think I'm just going to stop there. But uh, the question of culture and how this is all interconnected with culture, it's not simply, mobility is not simply a technical question. It is a technical question. It is not simply an economic question, although it is an economic question. And it's not simply a question of personal choice. It is also a, a question of personal choice. And personal choice varies from person to person, thus the name. Uh, but it is also something about collective structural forces that restructure the decision space of all of us. We may have a personal preference for this or that, but it is difficult to ignore the fact that when you choose this path and not that path, it will impact how you are perceived in the world. And these are powerful forces. Individually, we have choices, but collectively, we know how things end up. And there's a famous quote by Sinclair Upton, Upton Sinclair that uh, was quoted in the, the Al Gore movie, Inconvenient Truth. Uh, the quote goes something like this. It is difficult to get someone to understand something if their ability to earn a living depends on them not understanding it. It's a little tough to follow that. But basically, if it's in someone's best economic interest and social interest, in terms of their success, if it's in their best interest to ignore the impacts of their choices, then it's difficult not to ignore the impacts of those choices. It's just, we're human, it's a natural thing. And the way we structure our world, the way planners and architects play a role in structuring our world, will not determine individual choices, 
but collectively and in the aggregate, together, the statistics will shift one way or the other, depending on how we structure the world. And that's uh, the, the message that is largely missing from architectural education. Uh, and we need it. We have always needed it. But we need it more desperately now than ever before. So I'm going to just end there and open it up to discussion.